lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Sing hallelujah. could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The Cross is spoken. I am forgiven. The King of Kings called me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ.
Jesus, come on me. Jesus, come on you well. Jesus, come on. We welcome you. Jesus, come on me. Jesus, come on. You welcome here. Jesus, come on in. And Jesus, come on in. Hey, Grace Christian Fellowship, been so long. I uh, just want to run through a few announcements. Number one, Grace Christian Fellowship has now released two singles. You can check them out on YouTube. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And we're actually going to have a bunch more songs coming out. So just keep, stay tuned with us. And we're going to keep releasing some really amazing music. I am not a part of that. And so that's why it's so good. Announcement number two, check your e-bulletin. We had our uh, second winner, Bernadette, won a uh, coffee card, so congrats, Bernadette, for that. And the odds are high that you, yes, you could also win a coffee card, and we're doing it every week. So make sure you do that. Check your e-bulletin, because I'm not going to say any more announcements. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the sermon. Well, good morning, Grace. Why don't we take a moment to pray uh, before we jump in? Father, we thank you that you give us your word, <clears throat> that you lead us and you teach us your ways. And so we welcome you, God, as we, uh, as we listen this morning, and we pray that you would instruct us, Lord, that you'd lead us, that you would uh, motivate and change us, Lord, to be more like you in every way. God, I pray that for each person watching, God, that they'd know that they're part of your family, Lord, that they belong to you. And uh, God, we ask that you teach us how to be one together, how to pray together, Lord, how to raise up a cry, how to be uh, your people who pray your will and your purposes, who partner with you, God. So we bless you. Thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're now on to our sixth dangerous prayer, uh, and it is the prayer of lament. Now, on the surface, we might ask, ask ourselves, what the prayer of lament has to do with joining God, God's work as he restores and sets the world to right. Or maybe we're just wondering, what does lament have to do with those kingdom, uh, prayers of kingdom advance? And what I think we're going to find upon closer look is that what we'll find in this most unusual place and in the most unexpected way, that there is a dangerous and powerful prayer waiting to be discovered in lament. And for those of us who have eyes to see, I think there is a profound and hidden depth, of, hidden depth to discover in the command that Paul gives in Romans 12 when he tells us, he commands us, he calls us to weep with those who weep. Something profound about that. And that, that verse resonates in harmony with Jesus' first words that he preaches in the Sermon on the Mount when he declares, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so our, our simple goal today is that we would be encouraged to add to our arsenal of dangerous prayers that we're kind of learning and unpacking, being reminded of, to add to that a vision and understanding and a practice for praying prayers of lament 
why we do it, and how we can. And once we begin to see that, we can begin to process how important lament might be for us. We can understand how important lament might be for us in order to be equipped as God's witnesses in the world. And it's useful in at least three other places. Lament is useful. As we begin to see how it's a doorway for us as witnesses, as we specifically seek to practice speaking the truth and love in our community, something we're called to do as witnesses, to stand, as we seek to stand in solidarity with those who are poor in spirit, lament helps us there. And then also, lament helps us as we seek to resist that pull to assimilate to our culture. But before we get any deeper, let me start with a question that we have to answer before we can learn uh, about lament. And the question is this, what do you do with your pain? What do you do with the pain that you have? And the reason I ask the question is because we have to consider that, that those prayers of lament that we're being called to pray actually arise out of pain. They're occasioned by pain. So what do you do with the pain that you have? So um, I just want you to think, you know, who, who amongst us doesn't have pain? And I'm talking about any kind of pain, and I'll just list some. Pain of loss or grief. Do you have a pain of change happening in your life or transformation? The pain that comes from being in a relationship, whether it's as a, a parent, a child, a spouse, or a friend. Maybe some of us are experiencing the pain of failure. The pain of longing for more. The pain of disappointment. The pain from anxiety. The pain of love or lack of love. Whether you have any physical or emotional pain, what do you do with the pain that you have? Where does it go? And if you're here this morning, the kind of pain I want you to think about is specifically the pain that you really don't want to talk about. That's actually the pain that really probably matters the most. How aware are you of the pain that you carry within your heart, within your soul? Do you recognize that there might be places where you are holding on or have been carrying pain for a long time? And I imagine that there are some of us that are carrying burdens that no one else knows about. We look completely fine on the outside, and yet on the inside, if we were to share what's there, people might be surprised by how, how, how painful it actually is. And the reason there's a balloon beside me is because pain is like having an invisible balloon. It's, some, it's an invisible balloon that everybody has that you have to do something with. Some of us have more pain than others. So some of us, some of us have, you know, like really big balloons and others have small ones. And, some of, and most of us do at least one of three unhelpful things with the pain that we have in our lives. We do unhelpful things with it because it's painful. It's like that hot potato. You don't want to hold on to it. You want to do something with it. And the three things that we do with pain are that we repress it. That means we push it down. So, you know, you try and take this and imagine how, how helpful is this. If I just push down my pain, inevitably it pops up somewhere else. And that's where you see people lose control, become angry or raging or, or boil over. It's because they've been taking pain their whole life and trying to push it down. We know repression doesn't work. The other thing that we might do is, uh, the other R is we might retreat from our pain. We might avoid it. And, and I'll just demonstrate really quickly. If you're running, this, this thing's following me wherever I go. Your pain is like a shadow. Um, and... Um, then the, the last one is, is that we try and um, we just end up reserved to our fate, to, to our pain. We just end up reserved to it. And that means we view our situation. We kind of sit there holding on to our pain, just reserved to the fact that we, you know, we ha- we're going to be despairing about our lives. Now, when we think about what we do with our pain, whether we do one of those three things, we either repress it, we try and push it down, retreat from it, run away, avoid it, act like it doesn't exist. And that's what happens when you retreat from your pain is you end up, you know, into things like addictions. You seek pleasure. Um, you know, you can't really get away from it. You're just running away. Now, any of those three things, repressing, retreating, or reserving, um, there's no sense in pretending that we don't practice those kind of things with our pain. 
We all do that in various ways. We all have to manage our pain. Um, and, and really, I should be said that none of those three things are necessarily unhealthy for, 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 a, for a moment in time. It's not unhealthy to, to repress your pain or, or kind of put it aside or compartmentalize it. The problem lies that if these become our long-term strategies with our pain, we will find ourselves in unhealthy places. For many of us, the, the places of unhealth in our lives, whether it be physical, emotional, or relational, are actually related to the pain that we have decided to try and deal with on our own. This, this actually might be one of the most important things that we can consider about our, our own souls and our lives. And these are very, if we're honest, tender questions. Because no one wants to talk about their pain. But the more honest that we are with ourselves about the pain that we feel, about the hurt that we carry, the greater potential we have for healing. So what all three have in common is that while they work for a season in our lives, I mean, some of us have been running from pain for for decades. Some of us have been repressing pain for decades. Some of us have sat and just been sat in the grief and the despair of our pain without hope for for a long time. But the reality is is that while, while they work for a season, none of them actually allow us to move through and eventually get past the pain that we have into healing and into hope. What we have to learn about pain is that as fearful as we are about facing our pain, when we validate it instead of repressing it, when we accept it instead of retreating from it, and when we join it together with hope, instead of reserving it in despair, for despair, we arrive at the fourth R, which is that we get to do, we get to release our pain. We get to let it go and send it up to God. The only healthy way, and in fact, the only safe way to process pain is when we release it up to God. And that's why we're talking about lament. Because that is exactly what lament is. It isn't just having a a cry session. It isn't just about being upset or raging or complaining. Lament is the process of releasing pain to God that that leads to trust. Releasing pain to God that leads to trust. The risk I'm taking here in talking about our pain is that to discuss pain just in kind of these simple categories can often feel like an oversimplification. It can even feel like we're just patronizing. Hey, you know what? Don't worry about your repressed pain. Just release it up to God. It just sounds patronizing. But that is not the intent. That's not the case. Your pain matters to God enough that he gave up his son to make a way for us to not have to suffer alone. And because of that, we need to talk about pain. We need to talk about the hurt that we have. That, that, that none of us can escape in this life. Interestingly, Scripture contains two different versions of lament, this prayer in pain that leads to trust. It talks about how there's an individual lament and then there's also a corporate lament, meaning that lamenting is something we're to learn to use as a tool internally for ourselves. And you do that when you repent for something. You, you weep or you mourn or you turn because you, you know that the, this thing is actually bad for you that you're doing, or you've seen God in a new light and you let go of the old. So that requires lament. And then, this is important, we use also to use the tool of lament as communities and as friends together corporately. We need friends to process our grief with. And lament is one of the most prevalent forms of prayer in the Bible for a reason. It's because the Bible is full of stories of people in pain. Some 40% of the Psalms are laments. A massive chunk of the prophetic books in the Bible are expressions of lament. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. The book of Job is a big, long lament. And then, of course, there's actually a book called Lamentations. The simple definition of lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Another person said that uh, it's a prayer, it's prayer, but just in a minor key. Lament is the emotional language of loss as Christians turn to God in their sorrow, as they lay out their complaints, as they ask boldly for God to help and recommit themselves to him in trust. It's a path for navigating all of the fears and frustrations, unfairness, and conflicts that we have in our lives. That's what 
God has given us lament. Another author said, lament is an expression of our grief, an active process of a soul trying to wear out its pain, outlive it, persist through it, to a place of respite and a different perspective on living. It's the expression of a sorrow and a path to a life beyond that sorrow, a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Now, I wanted to lay that out. I wanted to give us, just remind us about what lament is and how, how, how important it is and what it, where it flows from. Even though we're not going to focus really as a dangerous prayer about the individual side of lamenting. Um, even though that's probably how most of us have practiced it in our life. We've used it as a way to process your pain. You've, you've called out to God in the midst of your trial. Or you've used it as a tool for, to anchor kind of your repentance and your change. Um, and so as we've gone through that, if, if you're thinking through that now and you're realizing there is pain in your soul, I want to pray for you at the end. And I want to not gloss past that. This might be a moment that you recognize and are honest, not only with yourself, but also with those around you who love you, that you need to release and let go or work through or address, face some of the fear of you have of the pain that might be in your heart, your heart or soul. So I want to pray for you for that. But today, what I want to get to, I wanted to you know, touch on lament, but really want to move into to look at how, uh, uh, how dangerous and powerful the prayer of lament can be when it's functioning within a community uh, that's looking to partner with where God is at work in the world. And what we'll find is when lament is being used as a tool in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian community, in a family, we'll find it helps us uh, in some of our most important and really some of our most difficult work. The places that are, that are, that are um, emotionally charged, that are difficult, we'll find lament actually is a tool for us as a church. And so here's three things I want us to think about. Lament helps us to speak the truth in love to those around us. Not only in here, in, in our community, but also in our broader, uh, you know, Center Wellington, Guelph, extended area, wherever you're watching from community. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to speak the truth in love, uh, but it, 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 it isn't easy all the time. And so lament helps us there. Lament also, second, second, helps us stand in solidarity with those who are poor in spirit. So lament helps us Stand in solidarity, stands alongside those who are poor and the poor in spirit. And then thirdly, lament is also an amazing tool to help us resist the pressure to assimilate in with our culture. So if you've ever felt that pressure to, to get conformed to the world as it is, lament actually is a tool for us as a church to push back against that and resist. So how does lament help us speak the truth in love in our community? And I want to look at two separate angles. The first is that lament helps us with the pain of tragedy, help gives voice to what we do in the midst of tragedy, but also the pain of conflict that we have. And both help us reflect the heart of God in those moments. And we know that those are difficult moments, tragedy and conflict. How do we show up and, and, and reveal and live out God's ideals and his values in those moments? If you want to know, think about this. From the angle of tr from tragedy, there's a story that I came across just recently about a renowned, a renowned French author and a Nobel Prize uh, winner for journalism named Francois Mauriac. And I, I could be pronouncing his name poorly. Um, in the story, Mauriac is being interviewed, and it's in the 1950s, uh, just some time after the Second World War had ended. And he's being interviewed about his work as an underground writer uh, for the French resistance movement in France, so obviously in France. And Mauriac uh, is a committed Catholic, and he has a vibrant faith. It's actually what, you know, led him and, and kind of charged him through the years of the war. And he's being interviewed by a young journalist from this Israeli paper. And they sit down to talk, and he doesn't know the young writer, but they, they hit it off almost instantly. They quickly move beyond the subject of the, the original interview, of his own work and into really a sharing of their personal stories. And you know, over the next few hours, they begin to get to know each other and they, they finally, they grow reflective about 
what had impacted the most uh, in the war? They kind of start, just kind of lean back. What was it for you? And Maury says, he says, you know what? He's talking to the journalist. He says, you know what? It's funny. The one thing that I cannot get past, the thing that keeps me up at night, wasn't even something that I saw physically with my own eyes. It was something that my wife saw that she told me about. He said, but it's so striking, it's almost like I was there. And the young journalist kind of sits forward in his chair and he says, what, what was it? What was it that she told you? He said, well, she was working at her family farm in the countryside, and she comes around the corner of the barn, she watches the familiar sight of a train passing by on the line that runs through their, 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 their family property. She watches the train go, go by, and only this time the cattle cars aren't full of animals, but of small Jewish children looking out, craning their necks through the slats in the wood, having been torn and separated from their families and crammed like sardines into these tiny, into these train cars, all of them destined for concentration camps. And she said there's just car after car rolling past her through this beautiful French countryside. And she said it's this juxtaposition of the day's quiet serenity and its silent terror. And in that moment, the young interviewer speaks up and says, yes, yeah, I remember that too. Because I was on that train. I was one of those children. You can imagine Mariak sitting there recounting something he hadn't even seen to the person that had lived through it. And what do you say in that moment of tragedy? And I want to read to you just from a book called Night. It's the, it's the foreword. Moriak is recounting the moment that he tried to think of what to say as a Christian to this young boy. He, he says this. He says, And I, who believed that God is love, what answer was there to give my young interviewer, whose, young, whose dark eyes still had the reflection of, of the angelic sadness that appeared one day on the face of a hanged child. What did I say to him? Did I speak to him of that other Jew, the crucif this crucified brother who perhaps resembled him and whose cross conquered the world? Did I explain to him that what had been a stumbling block for his faith had become the cornerstone of mine and that the connection between the cross and human suffering remains? In my view, the key, the key to un, the unfathomable mystery of which the faith of his childhood was lost. And yet Zion, he says, has risen up out of the crematoria and, and the slaughterhouses. The Jewish nation has been re resurrected from among its thousands of dead. It is they who have given it new life. We do not know the worth of one single drop of blood, one single tear. All is grace. If the Almighty is the Almighty, the last word for each of us belongs to Him. That is what I should have said to the Jewish child that sat before me. But all that I could do was embrace Him and weep. I want you to just listen. That is what I should have said to Him. And yet all that I could do was embrace Him and weep. This world is full of tragedy and pain. It's full of it. Stories like the Holocaust. I mean, it's close to Remembrance Day. We, we we're all remembering the, that sacrifice and, and really not only the, the gift of, of life that we have, but also the evil that, that, perpetu that was perpetuated in the midst of it. The world is full of tragedy and pain where the only right thing to do is weep. When a loved one dies, when a marriage ends, when a business fails, when a diagnosis is given, when a dream is shattered, any place where evil triumphs, when there are no answers, when there is pain, let there be lament. Let us speak with tears that which we cannot say with words. Let us, as Christians, bear witness to the presence of God in the midst of turmoil through the loving voice of lament. Let us reflect to Jesus who bends down 
in the dirt of despair, who weeps at the tomb, who cries over the city that's lost its way, let us reflect to Jesus who is not afraid to suffer with us and ultimately for us, who is not afraid of pain, but embraces it for our benefit. Likewise, lament is also, also helps us in the pain of conflict. And I remember the moment two of my friends had become so at odds with one another and we were sitting down together with hopes of, of working it out. And what had happened is they had allowed, in my opinion, they had allowed their unprocessed pain to grow into assumptions and frustrations and judgments that had poisoned their friendship. And they, they really couldn't see one another at all. And, and I was there in the middle of it and there was this pressure building up inside of me, this, this wound and, and, and longing and, and pain within me because there was no way forward it seemed between the two of them. No diplomacy that I could add that would work. No wisdom that I possessed that could help facilitate any change between them. Until finally, as I was trying just to say something, I just, I, I just really, I, I couldn't. I failed and I began to cry. I began to weep and try to express not only my own grief, but what I, what I realized now was the, the grief of the Spirit of God. And that moment changed the entirety of the conversation in my weeping. It deflated somehow their self-protection. And it helped them put down their own shields of fear. And it awoke them to a mercy and a, and a commonality and, and really a, even a, a love that they had forgotten. I read an article this week from a black pastor in Washington named Thabiti Enyabwile. <laughs> Again, I have no idea if that's the proper pronunciation. And what he found is he, he writes that he discovered that in the escalation of all of the racial tension in America that kind of continue, that kind of was building as some of these young men were, were shot and involved in kind of police shootings. And there was, you know, just we all know the turmoil that's, that's flowed out of that, that gave voice to, to the pain that existed there. Um, and he said, you know, he discovered in the escalation of that racial tension was that for their church, which was a multi-ethnic, you know, multi-generational church, that even though everyone meant well, there was an inability to know what to say really in the midst of it, what to do, how to respond. Even what he was saying, he felt like it, it was misunderstood and people, you know, were missing each other. They didn't know how to speak even to one another in a way that didn't drive each other further apart. And so, you know, in the middle of it, the, this pastor, uh, Thabiti, he found people on both sides feeling like you do when you're at a funeral. Is that you know you have, you know you're supposed to say something. You don't really know what to say, but you, you know one thing for sure is that you do not want to say the wrong thing in that moment. And his insight was that for his multi-ethnic church, what they needed wasn't at all what they thought that they needed. See, they thought that they needed more information, more insight about kind of how to speak, maybe some techniques. But what they found was what they needed was an entirely new language. He calls it the, the universal translator. Something that could take what they were saying and, whole, and mesh it together with what they meant rather than what someone was hearing. He realized they didn't need for information. They needed a process of, of conversation, of prayer that could hold together their pain and also their hope, their pain in the moment and their hope for the future that could hold their shared experiences of faith where, yes, we all know this is true, this is what we've experienced, and also their disparate experience of faith. I, that's not been what, I, what I've seen or known in my life. How do you hold those two things together? And they found that in le learning to lament together, that there was a way forward. He said it actually created a language for them. And out of lament, they built a bridge of grace that actually ended up changing and healing their community. And that's what lament is for. It's a language for a community that doesn't have the right words to bring healing. How many of us are actually thinking right now that that's something that we desperately need? So often we find ourselves without words to say, knowing that the next right thing to say is maybe even going to be the wrong thing to say. 
How can we speak together? How can we, how can we heal? And that's what lament does, is it gives us a common language that focuses our pain and our complaint, not to one another, but towards God. And then it invites him to draw us together in the midst of our shared pain. See, I don't want things to be like this. Lament allows us to see one another and hear one another as we're speaking to God about the need that we have. Instead of trying to communicate to one another, we, we, we listen to the prayer of someone as they're crying out to God. That's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to hear the cry of someone else's heart unedited, unfiltered. There's something different than if they just said it to you. Lament is a process born out of divine wisdom. It's the wisdom of God because it gives voice to the grief that lies underneath the conflict that we're experiencing on the surface. In this we find lament can be a powerful tool for us to speak the truth about our fractures and our need for healing, but in an atmosphere of humility and hope. So secondly, Practicing lament allows us to stand in solidarity with those who are poor in spirit. Because those, (laughs) this is the reality, those who are poor are already acquainted, they're already probably at the beginning of lament with the pain and the grief that comes from a broken world. And when we see, so, so when we lament the reality of the world as it is, when we say this world is not the way it should be, we validate and give words to the pain that they're feeling and that they already know about. But lament doesn't stop there because lament allows us um, into helping people, others around us, direct their cry from just going up into the air or worse to the ears of someone who might direct them towards bitterness or fear or retribution. And instead, it takes those precious cries of need and longing and pain and directs the cries to the ears of the one who actually knows them and sees them and hears them. Who ha- the one who has the power to change, to give them the power to change, or the strength to endure, or the perspective to understand, or the grace to live in the, in, in the not yet. Lament can serve as a guide to others out of their abandonment, fear, and pain, and into trust. Think about this. Think of your neighbors or your friends who are experiencing pain right now. You know they've got some situation going on. They're going through something that's really difficult. What are, what are we going to offer those people, right? You start talking, and all of a sudden you, you go, oh, man, I, am, I didn't know that. I, I didn't realize that that had happened. I didn't realize you were going through that. And it's in those moments, what are we going to offer our friends? You know, they, they, Christians or not, are we going to give them, you know, it doesn't matter if it's in church or out of church, are we going to offer them Christian platitudes? Those always land, really, when you're in pain. Oh, you know, God always wins. Are we going to offer them bold pronouncements of faith? It's all, it's all going to be fine. Trust me, you're going to be healed. Absolutely. No question. And here's the thing. What, do we, what if we don't have to give an answer in those moments? What if, you, what if you've never gone through what they're going through? How can you say, oh man, I, I really understand? You can't. What can we give those people? Well, Scripture offers us a way forward in lament. I suggest we join them in pain and grief, and then we park our pat answers. We, we self-edit the temptation to think that we can give them an answer that, that we really don't have. And here's what I suggest. I think it's actually biblical to suggest that we enter into the pain with them and from that place cry out to God beside them. And I want you to realize it's not that complicated. It's saying something simply like this. I am so broken for you. I'm just, man, that breaks me. I'm just, man, I'm praying that God would give you grace, man. Comfort, everything you need. That's my prayer, you know, like just so you know, I'm praying God give you grace for today because it's so difficult. Or, man, that is so unfair and awful and I'm praying that there would be justice in this situation it's just not right it's it's, and you can fill that in i want or or like i want you to know how much i appreciate you i'm thinking about you i'm i'm 
we're just broken about the situation and I'm and our family is is just we're going to be praying for you every night just so you know like really care about you the world doesn't know what to do with its pain. I mean, it has three options. It represses it, you know, or they, they try and process it, but does it get through to healing and hope? And the reality is we can't tell them what to do, but we can get down into the pain with them and model a way forward. Imagine you're crying out without hope. And I don't necessarily mean physically crying out on your knees, but you're, you're in a place where you need your, your, your situation is difficult. There doesn't seem to be any way forward. You're heartbroken. You're shattered. But then there's someone beside you who comes in and shares that load. It says, I, I'm broken too. But then they're not just broken, but they, they, they cry out and they direct that cry to God. That is a beautiful gift to give someone. It's a way to direct them to hope without saying, you have to do this. It's what lament is for. Thirdly, and in line with the first two, lament is also resistance. Resistance against being conformed to our culture. From getting caught up in in our culture's individualism, consumerism, or even just kind of penchant for being fearful or anxious. And here's what we have to realize. Lament sharpens the word of truth that in this life, Will I marvel and I enjoy the beauty around me? Will I delight in this world and its goodness? I also realize that it's irreparably bo- broken. And I don't know about you, but no one wants to be conformed to something that's broken. No one wants more of the recipe that, you know, no one, no one wants the food that's been recalled. Lament is like that layer of parchment paper between two frozen hamburger patties. It allows us, we're connected to the world, but separated from becoming one with it. And the reality is we can't join with it. And here's the warning. When we don't have lament in our lives, when we don't recognize and cry out and say everything is not as it should be, the further that we are away from that truth, the further we are away from lament, the more tempted we are to conflate political parties with kingdom priorities. The further we are away from lament, the more tempted we are to conflate the importance of our individual success with the will of God. The further we get away from lament, the more tempted we are to maintain an addiction to judgment. The further we are away from lament, the more tempted we are to keep attempting to fix things in our own strength. So here's another way. We get to use lament as resistance and against the allure of the world to say, actually, you know what? As good as some of that is, I can't buy in all the way. I can't let that define me. I will not worship that. I appreciate it. It's good, but I will not make it ultimate. And so, as we conclude, I recognize there isn't enough time to unpack all of the elements and important particulars of lament. Obviously, there's structure to lament if you read the Psalms. And you can look that up online. You can see what kind of goes into a lament. And it's okay because... The reality is that lamenting isn't some sort of exact science. It isn't surgical. You don't have to follow every step. You don't need to attend a workshop on lament to know what what, what happens. You just need to actually address your pain and consider it. And we can do that now. Consider the pain that we're carrying and whether we want to keep carrying it, whether we want to keep running away from it or burying it. Or, or kind of being resolved to the fact that that's just our life. And I've been saving, this is the actual dangerous prayer until now, but here it is. is if you want, to, if you want to, to, to pray that dangerous prayer, to enter into lament, this is the prayer. Jesus, let me share your heart for this world. Let me share your heart, your, what, what you feel for this world. I, and I, I think a song probably says it better. It's, it's a more beautiful prayer, but she, uh, Brooke Fraser says this. She says, Heal my heart, God, and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything that I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. So I want to just pray for a moment, first for those who 
maybe have pain you don't want to talk about, but you know you don't want to carry it anymore. You want to move past. You want to find a way. I want to just pray for you that you'd find, just give voice to it and lament. Just begin to process it, even if it's by yourself. Begin to open it up to God. It's funny, we can think that we're addressing things with God when we're really just kind of thinking about them rather than, than addressing them in, you know, with our mouths or writing it through in a journal. So I want to just encourage you, God, do that. And then secondly, I want to pray for us this morning. Commission us just as a family to enter into this lament, to think about the places where it's helpful for us as we enter into conflict or we face tragedy or we want to say no to the world or we want to, to be able to be you know, someone who can agree with and, and walk alongside those who are poor or poor in spirit. So let's pray. Father, you know now the pain that some of those, some of us that are listening today are carrying. You know some of it's unspoken. Some of it is something maybe, Lord, we're just even realizing right now. Some of the unhealth in our lives is actually just us holding on, unsure what to do. I pray, Father, that you'd hear our cry, Lord, we do not want to hold on to it anymore. We're frustrated about whatever the situation was, whatever the, the wound is in our, in our souls. We, we, we're, we don't know what to do, Lord. We don't have a way forward. And we ask, God, that you'd hear our cry, you'd deliver us, that you'd make a way. We ask, God, that this, this darkness, this cloud, this failure, secret, whatever it is, Lord, we ask, we offer it up to you, Lord. We're holding on and we're, we're tired. We need your help, God. Pray, Lord, you hear that cry right now. You direct us to the person or, Lord, even to the process, God. And God, I ask this morning, too, for us as a family at Grace, as friends, that we'd, Lord, that, that we'd be people that people want to have around when things are down. That we'd be those who reach out in love, not those who turn, turn away or count the cost somehow and decide it's not worth it. Lord, I pray you deepen our love for this world. Show us your heart, Lord. Show us your heart, Lord. Break our heart, Lord. Give us your compassion, your long-suffering. Pour out your mercy through us. Teach us, Lord, how to, how to be low and humble with those who are in the midst of trial. And God, I pray that you'd use us to be your presence and your voice in this world. Pray you'd take us into those dangerous places. Lord, as we pray these dangerous prayers in your name, Jesus.